All right, welcome, folks. Today on the Wellness Cafe, we have a special guest. We have Doctor William Davis on the show today. Welcome, Doctor. Oh, thank you. Glad to be here. How are you doing today? I, I, I'm wonderful. Awesome, awesome. So, for those who don't know you, can you tell us a bit about your journey and who you are? Sure.、Uh, I, I, I used to practice cardiology. I started in interventional cardiology, that is, procedural cardiology, doing stents and catheterizations and so on. Turned my attention to prevention and reversal. Of coronary disease, and that took me down some very unexpected paths. When I started to reject the conventional notions of doing procedures for heart health, and instead trying to really just stop the disease altogether, and it led me down some very unusual dietary,、uh, nutritional paths, as well as some attention to supplements. And、oh, what I noticed when I started to regress coronary disease, heart disease, was that so many other things happen. People. Had their rheumatoid arthritis reversing. I saw people lose astounding quantities of weight. I saw their acid reflux, plantar fasciitis, irritable bowel syndrome, migraine headaches, eczema, psoriasis, seborrhea reverse.、It、became clearer and clearer to me what I had stumbled on was a program for health. This was a lot of the basis, by the way, for the Wheat Belly series of books I wrote that start with the premise that wheat was corrupted by agribusiness. And that you can achieve astounding improvements in health by elimination of all modern wheat. I took it further by expanding conversation to elimination of all grains and saw even more improvements. But then I paid more and more attention to the nutritional deficiencies that were caused by grains. You know, it's often thought advocated by conventional、um, experts that grains actually supply nutrients. Actually, the opposite is true. Grains cause numerous nutritional deficiencies. <laughs> And when you eliminate grains, you have to make a specific effort to correct those deficiencies. Couple that with、uh, attention to some other common deficiencies, and what you have—the entire package of just a handful of strategies—is an astounding means of turning around、uh, numerous, literally hundreds of health conditions. And that's why I've repackaged as undoctored. The reason why I call it undoctored, by the way, was people were doing at the time the Wheat Belly program, and said, "Well, you know what? I did this. My doctor said it was stupid. It was harmful." It would end, make me end up with obesity and reliance on drugs. The opposite happened. I don't have diabetes anymore. I don't have Crohn's disease anymore. My skin rashes went away. I lost forty-seven pounds. I look better. I feel better than I have in twenty years. And I got well despite my doctor.、Uh, and I'm talking about conventional doctors, like my colleagues, the primary care doctors, the cardiologists, the gastroenterologists, etc. And so what I saw was we had in our hands the means to help people become healthy without their doctors, and getting healthier than the doctor could have ever achieved, ever hoped to achieve, even using the tools he had available, which is drugs and procedures. Yeah, and definitely, and I totally agree with you on that one because the best doctor is the body. If you feed it what it needs and remove all the toxins. And let the body heal itself, and you can be healthier than ever before. Yes, absolutely. And you know, the book goes into the details in saying that the healthcare system is broken, which hopefully we all know here that it's not working very well. We're spending more every year, but we're getting sicker and sicker. I mean, you, which you elaborate in the book really well, and I can't. And I'm not going to be able to do it as good of a job as you are. So, can you tell us、um, what about this current healthcare system that everyone should know? You know, so as you say, healthcare costs have gone out of control. We have eighty-four thousand dollars for a single vial of 120 tablets to treat hepatitis C. We have incredible five, six-figure price tags for. Uh, uh, medical procedures. These are unsustainable. So, as you know, American healthcare consumes 17.5 percent of GDP. What we don't often hear is that healthcare insiders, that is, people who are in the drug industry, the medical device industry, the hospital industry, want that number to grow to 19 percent or 21 percent. It's a huge wealth transfer from our pockets. Into the pockets of the healthcare insider, and I don't mean the nurse or the orderly or the guy working in the lab. I'm talking about the people who are in charge of the purse strings, 
the CEOs, the executives, the administrative people, the multinational drug and medical device industries. These people want their piece of the healthcare pie to grow even larger. So what they grow, what they advocate, is increasing reliance of the public on drugs and procedures. And we have my colleagues, the medical conventional medical doctors, who are the unwitting uh, uh, slaves to that process. So the TV commercial, direct consumer drug advertising, the advertising we see in magazines, and TV, and billboards for implantable defibrillators, and electrophysiologic studies, and cancer programs, and MRIs, those are all meant to grow the medical franchise, the bottom line of the healthcare industry. Lost in the conversation, as you know, is health. health. So I say the enemy of the healthcare system is not sickness. The enemy of the healthcare system is healthy people. <laughs> because if you're healthy, you are worthless to the healthcare industry. Because what they've tried to do is monetize health. They've tried to tell you that cholesterol needs to be treated, even though you feel fine. That you need to submit to an annual colonoscopy. That you need to submit to drugs and procedures in order to be healthy. But health should be free or nearly free. It should be something accessible to everybody at no cost. Now, if you break your leg or in your car accident, that's not free, of course. The health care you get, it shouldn't be free. But health itself should be free, just like freedom of speech. If I said, uh, Dr. John, in order for you to maintain uh, your freedom of speech, the U.S. government is going to charge you $10,000 a year. You, you'd be outraged. <laughs> yes, definitely. That's what, they've done. That's, what, that's what they've done with health. They've managed to monetize health, and I think that's wrong. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that one. And essentially – um, they're making more money and they meaning pharmaceutical companies making more money by keeping people sick so I guess the way to maximize profit is to keep you alive but sick enough that you have to consume um, those drugs on a regular basis and and it's sickening to see um, from a practitioner perspective as well where you have this idea that has been pitched to consumer that Drugs as prevention, right? Preventative <laughs> drugs, meaning like take statins. Oh, everything's fine, but hey, you know, you're reaching, um, you're approaching 50s or 60. Why don't you just take statin to prevent heart disease, which is ridiculous to me. It is. If we focus on the, you know, the, all these concepts I talk about came from my efforts to stop heart disease. It came from an effort about 20 some years ago. I helped set up a heart scan device in Milwaukee, where I live, and we started scanning people for a coronary disease, coronary calcium, as an index of coronary disease. And what I saw was just everyday people coming in with horrendous quantities of hidden heart disease, coronary disease, and when we put them on conventional therapies, like statin drugs and a low-fat diet, their heart disease progressed rapidly, 25 to 30%. We helped publish those, those data, we saw heart disease gallop forward at a rate of 25 to 30% growth in this, in this measure of heart disease every year, even if you threw all these tools at them. So I set about trying to find better tools. It took many years to do this, but it led me down the path of vitamin D mm. and elimination of wheat and grains and sugars because those are the only foods that cause the number one cause for heart disease, which is an excess of small oxidation-prone LDL particles and some other tools. But that's when I stumbled on all these, all the other health benefits that occurred. And it turned out to be almost free. I mean, you might have to spend a few dollars for fish oil, for vitamin D, but compared to the $1,000 a month for the health care insurance premium, the $150,000 it often costs for a heart bypass procedure, the many hundreds of thousands it costs for cancer procedures and drugs and chemotherapy, or the tens of thousands can cost just for the handful of drugs you take every day for type 2 diabetes. The costs you and I talk about are minuscule, almost almost nothing. Yet you get far superior health. So you and I know that compared to the health you get, say, from a conventional thinking doctor, like a guy who prescribes statin drugs and blood pressure medicines and acid reflux drugs and antidepressants, that kind of health compared to the health you can achieve on your own with some benign guidance the health we achieve on our own is far superior. You'll look better. You'll be thinner. You'll have better measures of health like cholesterol and blood sugar and blood pressure than the doctor could ever hope to achieve. 
Absolutely. And I just want to bring you back to that subject since we on the medications like the statins drugs. Um, I want to talk about the efficacy, which you talked about in the book called The Numbers Rackets. Um, can you explain how pharmaceutical companies are able to mislead the public by presenting the data in a certain way? Yeah, a, a big, big issue, as you know. So one of the ways they deceive the public is they fund the studies. So if the company funded this, and so I, I don't mean to pick on Ford or Chrysler or any, or, or any other car manufacturer, but if, if you went to a car dealer and the salesman, it's a Ford dealer, and the salesman says, sir, uh, Ford makes the best car in America, and we have the studies to prove it. And you say, well, who funded that study? You, they say, Ford. You would say, well, okay, don't even tell me because I know it's just marketing. Right. Well, you know that, but the doctors don't know that. And so we have the vast majority of drug data, such as statin drug data, the $2 billion plus spent on validating the prescription of statin drugs for cholesterol, virtually all of it paid for by the statin drug manufacturers. And most of the experts that develop clinical treatment guidelines for cholesterol are paid by the drug industry. They are major shareholders or they're, they have large consulting agreements. They're somehow affiliated intimately and with long-standing ties to the drug industry, and they're the ones drafting practice guidelines. So that alone. So we know that the bulk of clinical research that are purported to validate the use of these drugs, including statin drugs, are nothing more than marketing, very clever marketing, of course compounded by those good-looking, sexy sales representatives that come to the middle-aged doctor's office hawking free dinners and free trips to Orlando with all expenses paid. But we also have this added layer of deception where the data themselves have been fabricated and or manipulated or hidden. So the vast majority of negative outcome studies are never published. Many of the positive outcomes are published, but the negative parts taken out. We also have manipulation of, these, of the data themselves. So a very common trick in statin drugs and other drugs is to publish what's called relative risk. It's a means of inflating the benefits, purported benefits of drugs many fold. So the benefits of the statin drugs, you know, there may be a small benefit to statin drugs, like maybe a 1% reduction in heart attack. So if you, if you reread even the data paid for by the drug industry, you'll see that there's about a 1%, maybe 3% reduction in heart attack risk. Yet if you talk to the doctor, my prescribing colleagues, or if you read the ads, You'll see claims like 36% reduction in heart attack, 50% reduction in heart attack. Well, how'd they go from 1% to 3% reduction to 36% to 55% reduction? They manipulated the numbers and gave you this artificially. Imagine you went to the, your stockbroker and he said, Dr. John, I can increase your money by 50% this year. You'd say, oh, wow. Sign I me up. <laughs> right. But then you find out it was really only 2% or something like that. You'd be, in, you'd be furious because that would be fraud. Yet that is what the drug industry does every day. They inflate their values to not just like 10% higher or 100% higher. We're talking about 3,000% or more inflated benefits of their drugs. Yet that's how the data are often reported for cholesterol drugs, blood pressure drugs, antidepressants. So it doesn't mean that there are no benefits to any drug. It means that there might be some benefits, but it's hard to know if the drug was, if the data was manipulated, some concealed, and the statistics uh, uh, fiddled with. We often just don't know. The, the problem here, of course, my colleagues know nothing about this and often just prescribe their drugs willy-nilly because they were educated by the sales representatives and inflated statistics used in drug studies. So what you and I are after, what your audience is after, is just truth. And much of the truth means the drug industry is corrupt. The doctors who unknowingly, unwittingly prescribe it are also corrupt. And yet all you and I would want is health. So we have to turn to places other than the doctor other than the healthcare system for our answers. Wow, that's that's definitely powerful. I mean, since we're talking about big institutions, I just want to maybe we are to the right and and ask you about how about 
the government? How about the data from the American Heart Association? How about the data from American Diabetes Association or the USDA in in that manner? Are those reliable? So, as you know, we've had this odd situation where the American Heart Association, for for many years,、uh, advertised Crisco as heart healthy. They got paid a lot of money by the manufacturer of Crisco. Crisco, of course, is hydrogenated fat, which is not a healthy replacement for fat. In fact, it causes heart disease more than any other form of fat. Yet that was the darling of the American Heart Association for many years. Well, that that kind of misinformation has continued even to this day, where we have、uh, agencies like the American Heart Association or the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics or the American Diabetes Association telling us. That reducing total fat and saturated fat, eating plenty of healthy whole grains, and consuming the products they endorse, whether it's uh, 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 berry、uh, cakes or cocoa puffs or healthy whole grains, they call them heart healthy or a, a, an important component of a diabetic diet.、Mm. We all know that's absolute nonsense. The origin of that is because those agencies get paid. To say that, just as we saw the Harvard researchers got paid to distort the truth about sugar and fat, saying fat was bad and sugar was okay. In fact, the opposite is true. Fat is fine. Sugar is very harmful. They got paid to say that. The same kind of thing happens here with these agencies. They're paid to say those kinds of things. Why would the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, that is the the certifying agency for the nation's dietitians, why would they say that Coca Cola in moderation is fine? Because they are associated financially with Coca-Cola, so we have this situation where it's not truth that matters; it's who pays the most, and that's that's the mantra that drives American healthcare. And I think you and I and your listeners find this absolutely unacceptable, because we can bash them all we like, but they are richer and more powerful than we are. So this is why what we're doing here is so important. That people, so I'm not paying you. You're not paying me. Kraft Nabisco, General Mills don't pay me a penny. Pfizer, Merck, and AstraZeneca don't pay me a penny. Nor does Medtronic or other device manufacturers. We say these things because we think it counts and it matters to people just to be healthy. Yeah, definitely. That's why I love so much about your book is you're empowering people. You're empowering the public、um, with information, with resources. So that that when they、um, go to the doctors, they can actually be able to have a conversation, which is the next thing that I want to talk about, which is、um, basically the doctor-patient relationship has got to change. That the public has to really be able to equip themselves with some knowledge and some information to be able to have a conversation regarding health with their doctors. Absolutely. So the doc, this, so as you know, the paternalistic. I'm the doctor. You're the patient. Shut up and just take this prescription or do what I say. That was true uh, uh, when when the public was ignorant, didn't know anything about health. But it's not true anymore. As you know, the the informational playing field has been leveled. The information that's open to、uh, the average person is the same information that's available to you and me. Um, now we may have a broader appreciation of some other issues, but the public is getting increasingly savvy about health issues. And this idea that my colleagues just tell you to shut up and submit to that implantable de- defibrillator or the exploratory laparotomy, those days are over. You know, the origin of the word patient comes from the Latin word patior, which means to suffer. So, as a patient in a doctor-patient relation, your job is to suffer and to submit. Unquestioningly, to the orders of the doctor. This is like saying, if you don't follow my beliefs, I'm going to burn you at the stake. This is ridiculous. This is a time of age.、Uh, it's an age of、uh, of information, sharing information, of crowdsourcing, of collaboration, being facilitated by online tools. And the doctor should become your advocate for health, just like you're trying to do. You're trying to help people be healthy. You're not trying to use them to squeeze them for revenues and to grow the bottom line of the healthcare industry. So, as I often say, the enemy of healthcare, the healthcare industry, is healthy people. So you can do all your listeners can do their part in battling this awful monstrosity we've created called healthcare. 
by being healthy. And your doctor won't know what to do. When you look, feel, and measure better than anything he's ever saw, seen before, and there's really no need for medications, and he has no idea what to do, and he says, well, um, Mary, just do what you're doing. I don't understand it. And it's, I think it's stupid, and I don't profit from you, so uh, you, can, you can go now. Just do what you're doing. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's funny, but it's it's sad, but true. Um, you mentioned in the book we must have a healthy balance uh, between omega six and three, and what happens if that number goes out of whack, and what can a person do to regain that balance? Sure. So as you know, uh, there's a, there's a distinct deficiency syndrome when you don't have enough omega threes, and omega threes, by the way, have to come from fish oil, as you know. It's the only source you can get. Flaxseed, chia, walnuts, that source, linoleic acid, are just not reliable sources. Uh, likewise, a krill has so little EPA and DHA that it's you'd have to, you'd literally have to take the entire bottle to get you know, a sufficient quantity of EPA and DHA. Uh, so we're left with fish oil or and this makes some people mad, the consumption of the brains of animals. Most of us in modern, the modern world don't want to eat brains. You could, but you, it, 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 no one likes that anymore. So you're stuck with fish oil or, of course, consuming fish. But even fish has become a bit of a problem because, as you know, fish like tuna is rich in mercury and other heavy metals. So we're left with the safest workaround solution that is taking fish oil. Um, so we amp that up. So the average person starts with an RBC omega-3 index. That's, of course, how you measure the quantity of omega-3s in your, in, in your body. You measure the a quantity of the cell membrane, the red blood cell. Most average Americans start at 2.5%, a level that is marginally deficient and associated with increased cardiovascular risk, increased risk for dementia, and other health problems. The average person can increase it by eating some fish, which increases about 4%, 4.5%. But if you take an adequate dose of fish oil, which I would advocate 3,600 milligrams of EPA and DHA per day from fish oil, you can get to 10% or greater. And that's where risk, not only for sudden cardiac death falls up, but risk for heart attack and dementia also drop off dramatically. But that has to come from fish oil. It can come from chia, walnuts, flaxseed, or from krill. So we're left with fish oil. Now, as you know, so most Americans start with a deficiency of omega-3 and an excess of omega-6 because their omega-6 linoleic acid comes from cheap processed oils like cottonseed and soybean and uh, corn oil in particular. So uh, it's not clear if omega-6 is intrinsically harmful or whether it's just a marker for lack of omega-3. But I think it's the data would suggest there probably are some harmful effects of extreme intakes of linoleic acid, linoleic acid omega-6. So we eliminate those cheap oils. We get rid of corn oil and mixed vegetable oils and uh, other processed oils. And we go back to, of all things, saturated fat. We use coconut oil and palm oil and cocoa butter. And we eat the fat on our meats. We buy fatty cuts. We never buy lean cuts. We use more organic butter and olive oil. We use real and wonderful things happen, including a rise in the omega-3 if you're something official and a drop in the omega-6. And it, it, it helps you approximate better what wild living humans look like in their fatty acid composition. That is the people who are free of all the modern diseases of civilization. And what, what's a good um, optimal range as far as the, the ratio goes? Probably no higher than 2 to 1, omega-6 to omega-3. It's not entirely clear, though, that the, the, the omega-6 marker is a less robust marker than the omega-3 level. So the most important level is how much omega-3 you're getting. I'll tell you, if, so you can, people can actually measure these, these numbers, as you know. Uh, but the most important number uh, is to measure the RBC omega-3 index and try to achieve 10% or greater. But I will tell you, um, if you just take a minimum of 3,000 and ideally 3,600 milligrams of EPA and DHA from fish oil per day, almost everybody achieves 10% or greater. And you don't really have to get the test measured. Awesome. Now, you just mentioned saturated fat and um, fatty meat. I want to go into um, the, the diet part of your book where you recommend eating wild, naked, and unwashed. 
what does it mean? What does it mean to, to eat like that? <laughs> so it means it's my crazy way of saying go back to real foods. Don't eat the foods that are cellophane wrapped, that have heart healthy claims on them or sports figures or have long lists of, of unpronounceable ingredients. We just want real foods, foods that would be familiar to your grandmother, to your great grandmother, to primitive people. If we showed a piece of baked meat, a steak with fat on it, a primitive person would recognize that as food. If we showed them something like, you know, cellophane wrapped uh, green yogurt or, or crackers with all kinds of artificial ingredients, or they wouldn't recognize this as food. And that's why a lot of even animals and flies don't even go to those foods. So we want to return to real foods that serve intrinsic human need. And by the way, this applies also to nutritional supplements. I love supplements, but I don't like seeing people buy supplements that are nonsense. And a lot of supplements are nonsense. So the, the supplements that really count are the ones that address intrinsic human need, deficiencies and needs that humans have developed over many, many thousands of generations of adaptation to life. So if we correct, for instance, iodine deficiency, wonderful things happen. If we correct vitamin D deficiency that we need, wonderful things happen. If you take ashwagandha, mostly nothing happens because it's not addressing intrinsic human. That's not to say there might be some subtle benefits, to some of those kinds of nutritional supplements, but the supplements that really provide outsized, huge, life-changing benefits are the ones that address intrinsic human need developed develop through many thousands of generations of adaptation. Likewise, diet. So we revert back to the foods your body recognizes as real food. Right. And once again, the, the Wheat Belly book series that came out basically was integrated or fueled the paleo movement. And, and that was huge back in 2010, 2011. How is the undoctored diet differ from the paleo diet or is it the same thing you know i like to say that i'm just advocating a set of principles not necessarily a diet because mm. you know as you know humans can actually be quite healthy following a different a variety of different kinds of diets and this has been true all throughout human history that you could be quite healthy in new guinea and healthy in the himalayan mountains as well as in the jungles of south africa of south america so there are many different faces of a healthy diet, but there are several commonalities. No primitive human culture ever consumed grains, the seeds of grasses, until recently. So that's that's a given, and that's an overlap with the paleo type diet. My a lot of people in the paleo community are my friends, so I'm not picking on people in the paleo community. But the paleo diet often ends at diet. And I would ask, well what about cultivation of bowel flora? So a primitive person, a Paleolithic person, and a modern person consuming the same diets will look very different physically and metabolically. And that's because they are different. And one of the big points of difference is their bowel flora is very different. So one of the things that I try to advocate is let's try to reapproximate a primitive bowel flora composition. So I make specific efforts to address bowel flora. Living a paleo diet does not address vitamin D deficiency. Because most of us uh, don't want to run naked in a, in a tropical sun, and we don't eat liver, and we lose the capacity to activate vitamin D with sun exposure in the skin as we age. So you have to make a specific effort. And that's not part of the paleo diet. There's also some difficulty in the paleo diet when people think that foods like uh, uh, maple syrup and honey are consumed on occasion by primitive people. But if modern people do it, many of whom are insulin resistant, you can get diabetes, cataracts, hypertension, heart disease, and dementia by an overconsumption, overreliance on those kinds of sweeteners. So there, there's great overlap. I applaud the people in the paleo community for getting a lot of it right, but you can't end diet. There's too many other things to address, like bowel flora, vitamin D, and some other things. Definitely, and uh, a big part of it is the quality of those products as well. Wow choosing um, organic and grass-fed and um, grass-finished type products is going to be definitely way better um, choices. Yeah. So I, I really, the paleo community is doing a lot of good in, in, in broadcasting the value of diet. 
But I think you and I know that you have to go beyond diet if your goal is to be free of the healthcare system and achieve ideal health. And that's where we have to talk about recognizing uh, recognizing thyroid dysfunction, for instance, endocrine disruption. So there, are, there are there are issues beyond just the diet if your goal is ideal health. Definitely. Um, Dr. Davis, what do you hope to see happen with Undoctored? This may sound a little bit overly ambitious, but I think about Kodak. I think about that company that was a huge success story, listed on the New York Stock Exchange for 70 years, 140,000 employees, $40 $40 billion dollars a year in revenues, and we all had our Kodak Instamatic cameras and took our film to the drugstore to have it developed, even though many of the pictures were worthless and terrible. We still had to pay our $18 or so. They developed digital photography internally, but kept it hidden, scrapped it, because they felt it would destroy their conventional business. Your listeners know what happened next. Someone invented digital photography on the outside of Kodak, and they essentially went under. They're, they're still around, but in tiny, tiny, tiny remnant of their prior glory. I want to see something like that happen to healthcare. I want to see this monstrosity, this predatory monstrosity called healthcare, shrunk down to its essentials, which is a teensy weensy piece of what it is now. I want to see the drug industry shrink. I want to see the medical device industry shrink. I want to see the number of hospitals dramatically reduced. I want to see your health care insurance premiums drop from $1,200 a month or whatever to $200 a month and make it more affordable. As people recognize the health care system is a predatory, profiteering system. It is not intended to deliver health. And I'm talking about conventional health care. I'm not talking about what you're trying to do, what I'm trying to do, but conventional health care. It's predatory, profiteering, and it does nothing for you. You may need it if you crack your car up or bust your hip, but you do not need it for the vast majority of, of health that you can achieve on your own with some benign guidance. Definitely, and it's a $3 trillion industry per year. That's what we spend. And if we even shrink that by, let's say, 33%, we have an extra trillion to really allocate that to improve all the other aspects of the human species and nations, communities, and, and everything else. You know, it's, it's eye-opening to realize that the amount of fraud and unnecessary uh, spending in health care almost matches the U.S. military budget. That's how big this monstrosity is, that just the mistakes almost match the U.S. military budget, just the mistakes. So that's how big this thing is. If we could get people to just follow a handful of simple strategies and get them healthy and off their medications, uh, we would have accomplished something extraordinary, perhaps on a par with what happened to Kodak. What does your vision of medical utopia look like? Health, healthy people, Dr. John, just people who go to their doctor maybe once in a while in case there's something that needs to be detected. The vast majority of people do not. And people administer health on their own. Kids are educated in their schools about real health, that there are no more direct-to-consumer drug ads that influence and, and tell you you need these drugs to be healthy. I want people just to be healthy on their own. I want them to generate conversations of their, of their own, sharing experiences, you know, you and I don't have all the answers, and maybe in 20 years we'll laugh and think of all the things we overlooked and didn't know about. But I think what you and I have in our hands is as close to the tools for ideal health as humanly possible in this in this day and age. And the health that, that I know that I see every day in these people is vastly superior to the health achieved in the healthcare system. So I've got people who've been to doctors umpteen times, get annual colonoscopies, endoscopies, you name it, all the surveillance, testing, preventive care, yet they do these basic things. No wheat, no grains, limit your sugars, vitamin D restoration, iodine, magnesium, fish, all those basic strategies, cultivation, balfour. And what happens is they achieve women are in size four dresses, short order. They look 10 to 20 years younger. I mean that literally too. 
They're off their drugs. They feel better, more energy. They're more hopeful. They sleep better. They are far healthier than the doctor could ever have achieved, the conventional doctor could ever achieved. So that's the, that's the world I think you and I operate in, helping people be healthy without the predatory practices of conventional health care. Can you share with us some of your favorite resources um, for people out there to go educate themselves and to learn more um, from a patient standpoint? You know, that's an evolving world. I, I, I don't want to just toot my own horn, but the undoctored.com website, which is not launched yet, will launch maybe towards May of 2017 as the book comes out. I hope that becomes a big resource. One of the tools, by the way, I've introduced, I, I regret not having introduced this earlier, is to acquire the data. One of the things you and I need is data that says allows us to say things like, of the last 57,000 people who did this, they lost an average of 23.7 pounds in the first six months or whatever. They reduced the reliance on medication from an average of 6.7 medications per person down to 1.2 or whatever. We need to collect that data, large population data, people doing this. So I've got that project in place. We're going to collect these data so that we can show to the U.S. government, to healthcare insurers, self-insured uh, corporations, etc., that we have the means to affect health on a broad scale in dramatic ways so that we can effect change on a large scale. So that's that'll be in my uh, website, among other tools. There are emerging tools like patientslikeme.com or Cure Together. And these are websites that don't tell you how to be healthy, but they allow people to track their experiences in a variety of conditions. There are websites that advocate a specific piece of health, like Stop the Thyroid Madness is one of my favorites that has uh, wisdom about health by non-doctors, started by just a, a woman who was frustrated with the kind of ridiculous uh, advice she was getting from conventional doctors on thyroid health. She had to do it herself. Uh, so the landscape is, is changing rapidly. It's also being changed by the emergence of new tools. So we have all these smartphone apps and devices that allow you and me to measure health. I'm, I'm shocked, Dr. John, how fast these tools are coming out. It seems a day doesn't go by where there's, an ex there's some new wonderful tool. So it's changing rapidly. But what it means is, here's an interesting thing. We now have access to tools as consumers of health that the doctors often don't even have. So the Withings company, a UK company, for instance, has a device, it's a scale, that measures something called pulse wave velocity. That is an index of, of cardiovascular health. If you went to John Q. Primary Care or John Q. Cardiologist and said, could you measure my pulse wave velocity? He says, uh, we don't have that, but you have it. So I love that we have all these tools now coming out to the, to the hands of the public that even the medical industry doesn't have. Yeah, that's fascinating, and and I really want to applaud you for that and acknowledge you for being courageous and standing up for the public and really dedicating time and resources to do what you do and to produce or um, to make change, to create that ripple effect that will really assist in the um, the process of the awakening of the human species really to true health because we are born to be healthy. That's our birthrights. But then we have been really sabotaged by the big foods, big farmers, and also the basically the monopoly of the um, pharmaceutical companies. I should make clear also because I make some people mad, as you can imagine. But there are champions in this effort to undoctor the world. And so uh, your field, the chiropractic community, has been a real champion in this, as have the naturopaths, the, the functional medicine practitioners, the integrative health practitioners. I, I think we all agree. Let's talk about health, nutrition, correct nutritional deficiencies, avoiding industrial toxins through such things as hand sanitizer and um, uh, nonstick cookware, et cetera, genetically modified foods. I think we all agree. So there are bright spots in this, in this world, but it's likely not to come from your hospital. It's likely not to come from the American Heart Association or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It, you can get a lot of these answers from the chiropractors, naturopaths, 
the integrative health and, nutri and functional medicine practitioners, and occasionally some of my immediate colleagues, some of the more enlightened ones. So this is not to say that all practitioners are bad. That's not true. The enlightened, empowering practitioner can be very helpful in getting your free T3 thyroid hormone measured or helping you navigate through nutrition better. So there are bright spots in this conversation as well. Certainly. And for patients out there or people listening, sites like um, patients like me really empower you or at, at least make you feel like you're not alone in this journey because there's a lot of people going through the same thing. So check, Absolutely, yes. Check, yes. Check those websites out, guys. And I will link everything that you said up into the show note page. So... For those listening, go to thewellness.cafe and check out our show notes. So let's uh, move on to the last few questions, Doc. Where can people find you online? Right now, because a lot of these, the undoctored conversations came from the Wheat Belly disc conversations, so I still maintain my Wheat Belly blog, the Wheat Belly Facebook page. Um, but I'm going to also, uh, we will launch, as we talked about, the undoctored.com website, coming uh, in May 2017. And in that website and affiliate websites are numerous other uh, sources of information. One of the things I want to do is certify health practitioners. So we have growing ranks of healthcare practitioners who understand if someone came to them and said, I don't want to have lap band surgery. I don't want to be unhealthy and have all these inflammatory diseases. I just want to be healthy, but I don't want to do with drugs and procedures. I want to have healthcare practitioners certified. So one of the programs within on doctors is Undoctor U, a certification program. We also have educational courses set up for just the public who really want to be smart so that a, a mom, for instance, could do this for her family, her mom, her own mom and dad, friends, or we can have, let's say, a, a healthcare advocate in a church or in a corporate setting, they can become certified in doctored principles. So the undoctored.com website will be the portal, the centerpiece of a growing collection of strategies. And we'll have, of course, social media all set up by then. So we're, we're, you and I have this conversation early before a lot of this stuff has started, but it will. This should be a very robust and highly popular and I think very instrumental, very helpful set of uh, tools for people to refer to. So Dr. Davis, the name of the show is called The Wellness Cafe. What's your definition of wellness? Wellness is feeling terrific, having no diseases, and being freed of the predatory practices of this perverted thing we call healthcare. Just using common sense natural means, like choosing foods wisely, foods that suit your adaptation, correcting nutritional deficiency, the, the deficiencies that develop in modern people, and minimizing your exposure to all the awful things we now have in a modern world that come from commercial sources. So it's, it, and it sounds complicated. It's really not that complicated as you know. It's actually quite simple. But you'll be rewarded. People can save an enormous amount of, amount of money and suffering just by doing these things. And you can do it for your family also. Dr. Davis, appreciate you coming on today. Well, thank you, Dr. John. Keep up the great work. Thank you.